back ladies and gentlemen today we're going to talk about section 5.1 the mid-segment theorem and coordinate proofs i'm just going to give you a little heads up right now that both of these topics are pretty large and they're crammed into one lesson so this is a mega lesson so be prepared to take some notes and do some examples up on the screen as usual you will see your exit question for the day okay before we started off with section 5.1 i had you guys do a little exploration activity in the lab with geometry sketchpad or geogebra and we did a little exercise where we started with any triangle, any shape, any size, and we created uh, midpoints on each side and connected those midpoints to create mid segments. Then we examined the slope and the size of both DE and AC, and we came up with two conclusions using the manipulative software to basically show that the slope of DE and AC is always the same, meaning that they're parallel and that the distances of DE and AC are related in that AC is always twice the distance of DE. These two conclusions and this construction is basically what makes up the mid-segment theorem, which is a major theorem that appears in 5.1 and you need to know what it says and how to use it. So basically, if you have a mid-segment constructed, it is half the distance of its corresponding side of the triangle. This mid-segment theorem allows you to do a couple simple things. So why don't you try this example right here where u, v, and w are mid-segments or midpoints, and the some of the mid-segments are drawn on this drawing, and you have to figure out the variety, the information over there on the left. Some distances and which lines are parallel. Pause the video here and try to figure it out. Okay. Uv is related to RT in that it is half of it, so if you chop 90 in half you'll get 45. SR is related to VW, which it will be twice as long as VW, and SU is related to VW as well in that it should be half the distance of SR. SR was double, so it should be the same as VW. And then lastly, uh, VW is parallel to what line? Well, you could say SU or SR, either one would be correct. The next major idea in this section is called a coordinate proof. It's a different style of proof. It's not too far off from what we've been doing, but it's an idea where a figure or a shape is placed on a coordinate plane and some coordinates are given, and then you are asked to prove some statements uh, through algebra, so algebraic methods. So it's going to be really important that you remember things like the distance formula, the slope formula, midpoint formula. Uh, maybe even some area calculations, stuff like that. And it goes a little something like this. Usually the shape is put in what's called standard position, which basically means that you have to have, uh, or you typically have, not always, you have one vertex at the origin, and that rule is not always followed. Uh, you, for sure there is always one side on, maybe not the x-axis, but for sure an axis, and then they're going to do their best to label all vertices with coordinates. And the coordinates they're, they're going to choose are going to try to be as helpful as possible without getting too specific. So they're still generic variables, but they're trying to use any special properties of a shape to help with making them not so generic. The example I have on this page is that of a rectangle, and a rectangle has a couple special properties to it. It has four right angles, it has four sides, and each of the sides ends up being parallel to its opposing side. So if we do this with a rectangle, I put a rectangle so that it's one of its vertices is at the origin, and that happens to also make uh, two of its sides line up with the x-axis and the y-axis, so I should get some pretty special points out of this. Now there, without any additional information, there is no additional surprises here in terms of what size the sides of the shapes are. So a rectangle does not have equal sides. So one has a length of A, one has a length of B. If you were doing this and setting this up, you would choose your favorite two variables, A or B or whatever. But they need to be two separate ones. They can't be the same, otherwise you'd have a square. And then you need to label that fourth vertex so that you have all coordinates labeled. And if it's this high, B units high and A units wide or to the right, then that coordinate right there is the coordinate AB. The overall goal of placing a shape in this position or this idea of standard position and helping yourself out with these coordinates is that 
you'll be able to use them in a proof and hopefully hopefully something's going to cancel out and work nicely for you and sometimes if you set up your proof uh, in a separate way it could become more difficult for you so this is challenging and if you do it well you'll hopefully make your life easier for you when you do these proofs so what I'd like you to do here is I'd like you to try to put two of two shapes in a position that might be helpful or do standard position so I want you to put a square on a coordinate grid and I want you to put a rectangle that is kind of special the rectangle has is three times as wide as it is high so why don't you try to put those two shapes on a coordinate grid and label each vertex as best you can with generic variable coordinates but if there's any special relationship make sure that that's noted in the coordinates that you choose again pause the video here and make a drawing okay if you place a square on the coordinate plane then a square is special because it has uh, well it has right angle so it lines up with the x axis and the y axis and it only has one length to it so uh, whatever your variable that you chose, A, I chose, um, both coordinates are going to be over A, up A, and then this last coordinate is going to be the coordinate A, A. The rectangle, if you lay that on there, again lines up with the axes, and if you choose a height, I chose H, then the length of this one, or the width of this uh, rectangle, is three times that height. So, uh, the x coordinate is 3h and if we put those both together right there we have 3h and h. I have a third challenge for you and that is to put an isosceles triangle. Remember an, the only thing special about an isosceles triangle is that it has two congruent sides. So try to put that on there in as convenient of a way as possible. Alright there are basically two possible solutions to this that I could think of. You might have a third or a fourth uh, possibility out there but in this case, uh, we know that an isosceles triangle, I put the base, the non-equal side to the other two, um, so these two sides are equal in length. So I know that if this side is congruent to this side, then they must go up and over by the same amount, and particularly that over part. So if this will be like a midpoint right here, and if it goes over B this direction, then this way uh, the coordinate is just negative B. Uh, the height has no bearing on how long those sides were, so we need a second variable that is not related to the first one that I gave you. And then over here, uh, this is another way to do the, basically the same thing. Uh, you might have had just base or, or some variable right here, and then this would be half of that distance. But again, your height should not be the same variable as your width of your base at all. These are tricky, and you'll get used to it as you do more. I'll also say that most of the proofs that you are required to do have this set up for you so they know exactly which variables you want to use. Speaking of proofs, here is our first one. So copy down the drawing and the given information there. All right. In our given information, we are told that DE is a mid-segment. Now that's pretty special. D is a midpoint and E is a midpoint. And we're asked to show that DE is parallel to OC, which means that we need to find the slope of each DE and OC, which means you need to remember the slope formula. So if we talk about OC, and the OC is nice and labeled for us, uh, we can go ahead and do that, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if we calculated the slope of OC, then we get 0 minus 0 on top and 2p minus 0 on bottom. 0 on top over 2p. Uh, is still equal to zero. So we have a slope of zero on that or a horizontal line and you can kind of tell that just by looking at it. In order to find the slope of DE however we need to find the coordinates of DE. So uh, D is a midpoint of B and O so you need to remember the the midpoint formula which looks a little something like that and if you plug the coordinates in for B and O into that formula you get 2q plus 0 over 2 and 2r or the average of the x-coordinate and the average of the y-coordinate. Um, the top x-coordinate simplifies to 2q over 2, which is just q, and 2r over 2, which is just r. So the coordinate for d right here on your drawing is q comma r. Why don't you pause the video right here and try to find the coordinate of e? If you plug that in, it'll look a little something like that. 
Um, on that x coordinate, every term has a 2 in it. So you can actually cancel out a 2 with the denominator uh, and also with the y coordinate. So you get q plus p and r. And now that we have the coordinates, that's a coordinate right there, and that's a coordinate for d and e, we can pop that into the slope formula. Looks a little bit something like that, and you'll notice that a lot of stuff cancels out. You have r's that cancel and q's that cancel. So you get 0 over p, and that's the same as 0. So we have the same slope, and thus they're parallel. Here's our next one for the day. Uh, jk is a mid-segment. Prove that fgh has four times the area of jgk. Take a moment to copy down the given information, and I'll be with you in a moment. Okay, first thing we got to do, you got to think about, is that you need to find the area of both those triangles, the top little triangle on top and the large triangle as a whole. So let's see if we can figure out what we need. So to find the area of a triangle, we need a base and a height. So let's talk about the big triangle, because most of its coordinates are labeled. We have the origin right there, 0, 0, and then we have this coordinate and that coordinate all labeled. So it looks like we have the base here, uh, and then the height is a little tricky. I'm going to draw a line in there, an auxiliary line in there, just to help me out. And really all we care about is how tall this red line is, and it has a y-coordinate of 2q, so that's how tall it is. So we have a base that's this long, which is 2v, and we have a height of 2q. So we plug that into the area formula, and quite quickly we have the area of the large triangle. However, when we move to the small triangle, we got a little problem because that coordinate right there is not labeled, so that becomes kind of an issue for you. However, k is special. It is a mid-segment, so that means k is a midpoint. So you can use the midpoint formula to find the average of this coordinate and this coordinate, just like that. Again, doing some simplification, a 2 falls out, a 2 cancels out there, and we get a coordinate of v plus p comma q. So there's our coordinate right there. That'll help us find the base, so we need to find the distance of this line right there. To do that, we basically just, I mean, you could use distance formula, but basically just subtract the x-coordinates. We know that's a horizontal line because of the mid-segment theorem, because this is a horizontal line. Uh, so there's no up or down travel along that line. P's cancel and you have a base of v units long. Uh, the other thing we need is the height of the small triangle, which is from here to here, and you'll notice that uh, this base has a height of q, and then we go up one more distance of q to get here, so this little remaining segment must also be q, uh, which helps us out. And then we plug it into the formula, and there's nothing you can really simplify there, but you will notice that the area here is four times as big, so if we took this and multiplied it by four, we would get the other, and therefore the conjecture is true. So a couple hints before you go at it on your homework here. Uh, remember, the, gotta remember your distance, midpoint, slope formulas, area formulas, all that's fair game, anything that you've really learned. Um, have a plan, maybe try the algebra first before you jump into a proof. Um, try to place a shape with at least one side on an axis, and then choose helpful but generic coordinates and that's going to be the tough one for you. That's the, only, that's the only one that's going to get better with practice. Here's your homework assignment, and I'll see you in class.